God's army. Went from the Marines to God's army. Amen. Isn't God good? Don't you love to see God working in people's lives? And He'll work in your life too if you'll let Him. If you'll pay attention. You know. Well, we got a. So he was a Marine. Now we have a retired Air Force chaplain coming to speak to us. And you all know him, and you all love him. His name is Mike Coggins. Can put your hands together for yeah. Chaplain Mike. freshened up before it was time to speak and there were three distinguished gentlemen back there doing the same thing and they gave me some great advice you know they all concurred together and said Mike don't be nervous just remember we're all watching you and we're all judging you <laughs> so thank you brother Mike and uh, the other nameless people that were back there uh, if I can get somebody to help me I've got some outlines if I can get uh, there you go. I'll let you go on one side. You can go on the other. And I don't have one single scripture that I'm going to use tonight. I really have a lot of different scriptures, and you'll see those in your outline. And um, hopefully we have time to, to cover it. So I'll talk fast if you listen fast. Just take a moment, bow with me as we pray. Father, I thank you so much for the privilege that we have of having your word in our own language so that we can read it, study it, and understand it so that we might come to know you better. So, Father, as we listen to your word tonight, pray that you will enlighten our eyes, maybe to see some things we haven't seen before. Uh, open our ears. To hear things maybe that we haven't heard before and mostly father we pray that you will open our hearts to be responsive to what you call us to do through your word and we ask this in christ's name amen there's a place in uh, the nbc studios in burbank california uh, it's actually a room where a lot of celebrities have come through as they were getting ready to do their performance of whatever type it was. Uh, in fact, it's seen it share with celebrities, and if you were to look at the main wall, it's kind of cluttered with all kind of pictures of people, at least some from my era, like Rita Hayworth and Lana Turner and Loretta Lynn and just dozens of other pictures that are there. Uh, but the focal point of that whole scene uh, is the sign that's right above the vanity mirror. And it simply says this in bold letters. It says, if you want makeup, ask me. But if you want miracles, ask God. You know, God is in the miracle makeover business. And He wants to change us. Not our hair, but our heart. And He wants to change not just our appearance, but our attitudes. And he doesn't want to change our body, but He sure wants to change our behavior. You see, being a disciple of Jesus involves change. Uh, you know, there's a multi-billion dollar industry out there, or several different industries, and their whole purpose is to make money off convincing you that you need to change. Whether it's your hairstyle, or your clothes, or something else about your appearance, or even your body. In fact, there are a lot of cosmetic surgery offices that have sprung up over the last years. They, they kind of spring up like dandelions in summer. And you know, men and women alike, you can, you can go in there and you can get a snip here and you can get a tuck there and you can get something taken off here or something added there. 
And it's all about changing the way you come across and look to others. But you know, all that kind of change is simply external, right? I mean, it's just, it really is superficial when you boil it down. You know, Jesus talked a lot about change. And as you read the Gospels, you know that he confronted a lot of people with their need to change. He didn't. Confronted the Pharisees, confronted the scribes, confronted the Sadducees. I mean, he confronted a lot of people with their need to change in different ways. You may not realize the group that he challenged to change the most were his own disciples. Bruce, if you'll put up Matthew uh, chapter 10. Bruce back there? Yeah, okay. You know, when first the 12 disciples that Jesus had chosen, this is the context of the scripture, he called them to himself because he was getting ready to send them out to basically cast out demons and to heal and to preach. But before he did, he had a little pep talk with them. And in the pep talk, he said this. A student, now let's, let's clarify the word. Actually, in the Greek, it's matetes, which is disciple. So Jesus said, a disciple is not above his teacher nor a servant above his master. It's enough for a disciple to be like his teacher and servant to be like his master. And in Luke chapter 6, verse 40, Jesus really was talking to a larger group of disciples. You know, one time he had over 500 people that were following him as his disciples. And so it was in that context that in Luke 6, 40, Jesus said almost the same thing. He said, a disciple is not above his teacher, but when he is fully trained, he will be like his you know, being a disciple involves change. The question is, what is God trying to change us into? You know, I think Jesus kind of answered that for us. That for His disciples, we're to be like the one who teaches us. We're to be like our Master. And who is that? That's right, Jesus. Uh, some of you may be familiar familiar with Gilda Radner. Anybody remember her from a uh, great comedian? Uh, kind of staple on Saturday Night Live just years ago. And she has a book that was entitled, It's Always Something. Anybody ever read her book? Anyway, it chronicles her fight with cancer that eventually uh, took her life. And in the very end of that book, she tells a story about her cousin who had a dog. And this dog was female, it was pregnant, and was ready to give uh, birth in about a week. But just before it was supposed to give birth, it had an accident that left it without its back two legs. But you know, that didn't stop that expectant mom because in that week before she gave birth, she learned to walk again in a new way by taking two steps in front and then flipping up her backside, then taking two steps in front again and flipping up her backside again. Well, she gave birth to six healthy puppies. And when they learned to walk, they all walked, taking two steps in front and flipping up their backside. Oh my just God. like their mom. Wow. You know, the scripture tells us that we're to walk like Jesus. You know that in 1 John uh, 2, 6, it says if anyone claims to live in Him or claims to abide in Him, in Jesus, he ought also to walk or live even as Jesus walked. Well, there are a couple of other scriptures, and you've got the outline if you want to follow along. One of those is from Romans chapter 8, verse 29. And it says this, For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. And then also in 2 Corinthians 3.18, the scripture says this, And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into His likeness with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. You know, I think the point is clear in those scriptures that God's blueprint for our lives, God's pattern for each one of us once we become a Christian, is exactly the same. Jesus Christ is our blueprint for what God wants us 
to look like. Now, that doesn't mean that we're all going to sound the same, we're all going to look identical, or we're all going to dress the same. I mean, we can only hope that's not true. But what it does mean is that the life of Jesus should shine clearly and uniquely through each one of us. That's what God desires. Well, the question is, if God is working on us to kind of change us, uh, what are the tools that God uses to make this change happen? Well, let's think for a moment. At some times when you were going to make some major changes in your life, how did those changes begin? Like if you were going to lose weight or you were going to get into a fitness program or you were going to go to school somewhere or stop doing something and start doing something else. How did the change first begin? Mental. That's right. Yeah, any kind of change you want starts right there in the mind, doesn't it? It starts kind of with a change of attitude about whatever that is <coughs> and then also a decision of your will to make that change happen. And becoming like Christ is the same thing. It begins in the mind where we have to change, or we don't have to change our mind, but we have to let God change our mind or renew our mind. And God does that through the tool of His Word. Look at Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. It says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, or brothers in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. And this is your spiritual act of worship. And he goes on to say, don't be conformed any longer to the pattern of the world, but be transformed, how? <coughs> By the renewing of your mind. And you see, it's once our mind is renewed that we're able to test and prove what God's will is, what God's good and pleasing and perfect will is for our life. But it takes that renewal in our mind. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 20 to 24. Bruce, if you'll bring that up for us. You, however, did not come to know Christ in that way. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by deceitful desires, and to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. You know, I think that's amazing how Paul puts that in the scripture. Because it's a, it's a three-step process. You begin putting off the old. But then you have to have your mind renewed before you can put on the new. You've got to have the attitude of your mind, the spirit of your mind renewed. Before you can be, begin to put on that new man created to be like God in true righteousness and true holiness. You know, that doesn't happen by God just coming down and zapping us, though, does it? You know, the Wycliffs are doing a great job out there translating the Bible into languages. But you know, that Bible that they translate in that language won't do them any good unless the people begin to read it. Same thing with the Bible that we have. It doesn't do you any good unless you read it and study it and meditate on it. And begin to internalize that word. You see, it's the word of God that shows us what Jesus is like. And if we're to be conformed to the image of Christ, we need to know what he's like, don't we? Well, it also shows us what God's commands are and tells us what God's will is. Will is and it also gives us the encouragement and the strength that we need to make the changes that God wants to make in us. Let me sum up one other passage. It's 2 Peter 1, uh, verses 3 to 4. And I love what this scripture proclaims about God's provision for us in this. It says that His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. <coughs> through these, He has given us His very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and state the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. So how do we participate in the very nature of God? Do we need to read that again? We participate in it through the promises God's given us in His Word. 
We have to read that word and study that word to be able to participate in the very nature and character of God. I don't know if you're familiar with the lady named Barbara Johnson, but she's a Christian author, written, uh, writes with a lot of humor. And I love this one thing that I found in one of her books. She says this, when the child of God looks into the Word of God and sees the Son of God, he is changed by the image of God. He is changed by the Spirit of God into the image of God for the glory of God. Hmm. Let me read that again. When the child of God looks into the Word of God and sees the Son of God, he is changed by the Spirit of God into the image of God for the glory of God. You want to be changed into the image of Christ for the glory of God? You've got to look into the Word. Because that's one of the tools that God uses to renew our mind so we can put on that new man created in Christ's image. You know, there's some other tools that God uses. Tools of the trade that God uses to kind of shape us. I want to read through these passages. John 15, 1 through 2. Anybody have a Bible? My throat's getting kind of dry. Or maybe you could just read that off the screen for us. Okay, Pastor. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch and either bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit proves so that it will be even more fruitful for Christians. That's good. And then Hebrews 12, 7 to 10. And if someone will volunteer to read that, I'd appreciate it. Yeah. Use your loud speaking voice. <laughs> it, is for, it is for a disciple that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not decide on discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us on the perspective of that. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of the Spirit and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but yet um, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. That's good. That's good. Thanks. And in James uh, chapter 1, verses 2-4, to four, Somebody will read that for us. <clears throat> Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Some of you may have heard of a lady named Deborah Ricketts. She's a uh, independent researcher for the film industry. And uh, her job is to cut out anything that doesn't belong in the film. In fact, anybody remember seeing Raiders of the Lost Ark? Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, you see, before Deborah got a hold of it, there was an error in it. When they were routing on that map, remember when Indiana was flying over, he was being routed over the map? Well, initially, it had him routed going over Thailand. Wrong. <laughs> well, the problem was the movie was set in 1936. But Thailand was called Siam until 1939. You know, that's the kind of stuff that Deborah Ricketts finds. I mean, she looks at everything, the minutest detail. She looks at the script. She looks at the set. She looks at the scenery. She checks out the wardrobes. Everything comes under her scrutiny. And whatever doesn't fit, she prunes it. She cuts it. And you know, that's what God does with us. The things that are inconsistent with the life of Christ in us, He wants to cut away and prune so that we can be more fruitful. 
two of the things that God uses to prune us, at least he's used to prune me, one is the passage in Hebrews about discipline. Man, when we're out of line, if you're his child, mm-hmm, he knows how to take you out behind the shed. He knows how to discipline us. And what that is, it's God pruning us, and if you pay attention to the last verse, he does it so that we can share in his holiness. That's why he does it. And what's interesting, it says he does it for our good. You know, a lot of times my dad punished me. I wasn't so sure it was for my own good. You know? Or maybe he was just upset or something. But God punishes us, disciplines us for our own good so we can share in his holiness. Well, another thing that God uses to prune us, another tool, is trial. Because when trials come, whatever kind of trial it is, it, it tests our faith. But James tells us that we need to let those trials have their perfect work so they produce in us not only perseverance, but maturity. And what is maturity for the disciple of Christ? It's attaining to the full measure of the stature of Christ. That's what maturity is. Taking on in us or taking having developed through us the character of Christ. The more we grow in Him, the, warm, the more we mature. The more people see Him in us. But again, that stuff won't happen in the soil of comfort in our lives. I mean, it really does. God has to prune us. You know, James, if, if it were easy, more people would be doing it with him. <laughs> but it's not. You know, change doesn't happen by the waving of a wand or through osmosis. I mean, you can't just take the Bible and put it under your pillow at night and go to sleep and hope to absorb some of the stuff that's in it. No, it doesn't happen that way. You know, and it, it doesn't happen through just wishing change would happen. But it happens through God pruning us, cutting away what doesn't belong, and developing within us the character of Christ. Well, I tell you, I'm a slow learner. So I'm glad that God is patient with me in the process. Amen. If you're following, you know, in your little handout. Uh, that's the next thing. You know, what I realize is that change is a process that requires time. And because of that, I'm thankful God is immensely patient with me in that process. Uh, you know, I realize that being here in this church that I'm in the presence of some great fishermen. Uh, they've got more experience than me. Uh, they often have more success than me. So, so I really hesitated to tell some fish stories here, but, uh, but there is a point to them. So it, even if you don't like the fish and you don't like to eat them, just bear with me for just a minute. I grew up learning how to fish from the time I could hold a pole. I mean, I fished for salmon in Alaska. Dad taught me how to fish for redfish off the coast of North Carolina or for bass and crappie and the lakes of Texas and stripers in Virginia and king mackerel and cobia and all kind of other saltwater species off the coast of North Carolina. Uh, so by the time I could hold a pole, I've been fishing somewhere. And, you know, compared to some here, I guess I'm a, a fair fisherman. Uh, but I haven't always been, you know, a good fisherman. Learning to fish for different species in different conditions takes time. I mean, it really does. Uh, teaching someone to fish takes patience. Something my dad possessed in abundance. I can remember... Uh, one of my first experiences fishing with him, and we were in Alaska. And the first lesson my dad tried to teach me was, you know, when you pull the release bell back, make sure that it locks in place so that when you go to cast your lure, it doesn't flip back and you break a line and you lose the lures. I lost a lot of lures in Alaska before I learned that lesson. But then there was a time on the North Carolina coast that... Uh, we got up early to get that first run of King Mackerel, you know, first light. Uh, and, of course, there we fish warm different than we do here. 
we used two lines, an anchor line, and then a bait line, which kind of went down on a little trolley, a clothespin down that anchor line, and so you let the bait fish down there. And anyway, my dad was teaching me how to let that bait fish down, and of course, you're using a bait casting reel. And he said, Mike, be sure to keep thumb pressure on the line so it doesn't backlash. Well, I didn't, and it did. Yeah. And I know my dad, I remember, he must have spent almost that first hour trying to get that knotted, twisted line out of that reel so we could even use it and save some line in the process. You know, I think my most memorable mess up was in Lake Worth, Texas. Like my dad let me skip school that day. Uh, day before, he told me it was going to be a day off. And he said, if you don't want to go to school, you don't have to. I mean, what kid's going to turn that down? So, <laughs> so we got up early that next morning, and we went to the boat docks. Lake Worth is uh, right adjacent to Carswell Air Force Base, which is where we lived on base. So we just went to the base boat docks, and we got our canoe, and we got our minnows for bait, and, and we paddled out to the far side of this lake. Uh, to this clump of Crap. nice lily pads and stuff. And, you know, before I could get a minnow on the hook or a line in the water, I forgot the cardinal rule of canoe. Anybody know what that is? Yeah. Never, never lean over in the same direction at the same time. <laughs> I mean, there is nothing like an early morning swim in freezing cold water in November to kind of wake you up in the morning. I don't think we ever recovered all that sunken fishing hat. Uh, but you know, my dad was patient. And finally I did learn a few things from him. And you know, while I was still alive and after I was an adult married and had my own son, and, you know, my dad would still let me fish with him. As long as I bought my own lures. <laughs> untangled my own knots. And we stayed on shore. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what does that have to do with becoming like Christ? Well, this. That God's patient with us in the process. Even when at times we may throw away some of His best gifts or discard them or use them or leave them unused, He's still patient. And God is still patient when we get our lives just tangled up in knots make a mess of it. Man, God's patient when we turn our lives upside down for ourselves and those closest to us. He's patient. You know why He's patient? Because God is committed to the process. Philippians 1, 6 said it this way, being confident of this, that He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus You know, I'm not perfect. I haven't arrived. God is still working on me. And I thank Him for His patience. You know, there's one other, one other part of this process, and you have it in your outline. Okay. I think, and it's our part in this whole process, you know, sometimes I think we're resistant to the change that God wants to work in our lives, uh, probably for two different reasons. At least I've experienced this in my own life. One of those reasons I'm resistant is fear. Don't always know what to expect. Don't, don't really know. I mean, if I fully commit myself to God and say, God, you just do whatever you want with me and you make every, any change you want, I don't know what He's going to ask. I don't know what He's going to require. I don't know what He's going to tell me to give up or what He's going to tell me to do or what He's going to tell me to take on. And so sometimes we resist the change just because we're afraid because we don't know what that's going to mean. Mean for ourselves or mean for our families. But for the most part, I resist change because I'm stubborn. I don't want to change. Maybe that's your case too. You know that. You know sometimes I think we just get comfortable with the way we are. You know we get comfortable sometimes with some of our habits and attitudes and behaviors. And, uh, sometimes we don't even see that we need to change them. Uh, to our wife points it out to us, or <laughs> our husband, or, or our child, or somebody else close to us. 
you know, sometimes in our stubbornness we make excuses. You know, maybe we tried to change in certain areas and, and we didn't do so good and we fell back into it. So, you know, we just got frustrated. We just quit. Just don't want to change. Don't want to work on that area anymore. And sometimes we make excuses. Maybe you've heard it. Well, I've always been this way. You know, I've always been impatient. I've always had a short temper. Or sometimes we blame it on parents or other people. I picked this up from my parents. It's a family trait. But the bottom line is we don't change because we don't want to. God wants to work on our want to. And I think King David had the right attitude about that in Psalm 139. He expressed the right attitude this way. He said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and, or test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. You see, our part in this whole process of God changing us, and our most important part, is just to be willing to change. Just to say, God, search me. Test me. Show me the way you want me to change. Lead me in your way. You know, there are some people here tonight and Maybe this lesson didn't make any sense to you at all. Because you don't have a personal relationship with Christ. I mean, why do you want to change and become like someone you don't even know? So God's not requiring of you tonight to become like Him. What God wants of you tonight is just to believe in Him. To receive Him. To accept Christ's death on the cross for you and His resurrection to put you right with God and just ask Him to come into your life to be your Savior and your Lord. That's what God wants of you. But for those of us that know Him, claim to be His disciples, God wants us daily to become more like Him. To be changed into His image. And do you know what? It's as we change that we have a greater testimony. You know, it's the testimony of a changed life. And Drew mentioned some of the things that he was like before he became to know Christ. And then once he did, the change that God made. And God continues to make changes. But it's the testimony of a changed life. It's the person of Christ shining through us brighter and brighter every day. That shows to the world that what we preach in the gospel has transformational power. And it's real. Because it changes us. The question is, are you willing to change? I asked the pastor to come up and I wanted him to kind of lead in our time of prayer. And we consider these things. Let me ask if you'll bow your heads tonight with us. Maybe the Holy Spirit is speaking to you today. saying, hey, there's areas we need to work on in your life, but you're resistant to change. You might lose. I remember that I was reticent to change because I didn't want to lose my friends. I thought, man, I've got really good friends, and if I become a Christian, I'm going to lose my really good friends. Well, in actuality, they were not really good friends at all. God wanted to, you got to let go of some things for God to give you better things. And when I let go of my friends, God gave me even better friends and even more friends. So you think you got something good going on, and it's really just chump change. And God has got some great stuff for you. How many be honest with me and raise your hand and say, Pastor, I need you to pray for me. There's things in my life I know, I feel I need to get rid of. For God to move in my life, I've got to get rid of some things. Just lift your hands. I want to see you, and I want to pray for you. Yep. I see those hands. I see those hands. Anybody else? How many would say, Pastor, you know, I don't even, I've never even committed my life to Jesus. I don't go to church. I don't read His Word. I don't pray. I just don't even know Him. How many would say, but I'd like to know Jesus. I'd like to ask Him to come into my life and change my heart. Would anybody raise their hand and say, that's me, Pastor? Nobody's looking around. I'm not trying to 
embarrass you, but I'll tell you, when you come to our church, you're always going to get an invitation to accept Jesus into your heart. Anybody here would like to raise your hand? Hallelujah. How many understand the sermon tonight? That God wants everybody to change. That everybody can go to the next level. There's something that everybody can do with more fervency and more passion. Instead of sitting on the sidelines with a beer and blending into the crowd, it's time to put away these things and move into the family of God and get involved. How many of you say, I need to get more involved in the Lord? Raise your hands. I need to get off the sidelines. Yes, yes. A lot of hands went up. Here's what I want us to do. I'd like us to all stand our feet and come forward to the altar. Everybody who raised your hands, if you don't... If you didn't raise your hands, you don't feel like coming, you're not comfortable, that's okay. Just stay in your seat. But if you raise your hands and you know that God is drawing you closer to Him, God is drawing you out, God is challenging you to change, I want you to come forward.